All right, line A1, learning task 13, we're going to take a look at uh, capacitors inside of DC. And once again, this is DC. We will examine these things when we go into AC, and AC is just like DC that's changing back and forth, but it's changing back and forth in magnitude. It's not going to a steady state. What we're looking at over here is capacitors in steady, flat line type of DC. And we will have to use all of this theory later on when we get into our electronics for second, for third, for fourth, etc. So hold on to the theory that you pick up inside of here because we're going to need it to explain a lot of other stuff later on. The very first illustration inside of here shows charging of a capacitor. And what we have is we have got a power source over here. We've got a battery. We've got the cap itself. And we have got a switch that is going to be shown over here. Uh, very first thing that you should know is that the capacitor or the power supply, whichever one, is in this circuit backwards, right? Because we see that we have got a polarized capacitor, which has got a negative on it. And we've got the thing connected to a positive. Okay, just disregard that. I don't know who drew this picture, but clearly they screwed up these first couple of pictures that they had over here. We'll skip past that. Uh, I will talk about what theory they were trying to go and tell us behind here. We know that we have to go and satisfy our laws. Kirchhoff's law of voltage, Kirchhoff's law of current. Kirchhoff's law of current is going to make sense. You know that we're going to have all the current into the circuit is going to have to come back out to the battery. Kirchhoff's law of voltage is also going to have to make sense, which is that as soon as I have got current flow inside of a circuit, a complete circuit, whatever I have got for my source voltage has to be dropped across my load. And my only component inside of here is my capacitor. So if I were to go and close this circuit, the instant that I would close it, I would somehow have to go and drop all that voltage across here. I'd have to go and charge up to full source voltage. And in order to go and do that, I would have to go and satisfy uh, V and my Q and my C, which is just going to be a rewriting of this, right? We know that if we had C uh, is equal to um, Q over top of V, which is our standard formula for capacitance, that we should be able to just rewrite this thing as being my voltage is equal to my charge in coulombs over top of the capacitor. Well, what is charge of coulombs? Charge of coulombs is going to be a mass amount of electrons. I'm just going to make this thing proper so we can see it. The mass amount of electrons would have to be over here, right? If I'm going to have voltage across here, I'm going to have to have a physical finite quantity of electrons that are going to be over top of that capacitor itself. How would they have gotten there? Well, they would have had to get there by flowing from this supply over to this. And then they give us like, even if, you know, this thing had 50 milliohms of resistance. If I wanted to go and get that full 120 volts across there, what I would have to do is I'd have to flow through the circuit ridiculously quickly. They show a little bit of base math over there, some ohms laws show that you would need to go and have 2400 amps of instantaneous current flow out to that cap if I wanted to go and charge that thing up instantly. Because this is impractical, it's not that we don't have supplies that could supply 2400, but just for most supplies, we wouldn't want to have to do that. Because it's impractical, we're going to slow down the current flow to this thing by putting in some sort of a resistance. Once again, battery is upside down. We'll quickly fix it. So that, apparently I'm not fixing it. That was a terribly drawn one. Quickly fix it so that we're ready to go off of this one. Same deal as what we had before, but now we have got two components. These are going to be my load. This is going to be my source. And we know that, once again, we have to satisfy Kirchhoff's law of voltage, which is that the sum of all voltage drops, whatever we drop over top of our loads, has to be equal to my source current that I'm going to go and have over here. Let's go and take a look at what happens when we close in on the switch. We'll start with the switch open. When the switch is open, there is no current that is going to be flowing through here. Therefore, the volts over top of this, V is equal to my I times R. And if this value at the switch open is zero, therefore I'm going to have zero volts dropped across there. And if I have zero volts uh, that has been dropped across there, and if this is open right now, I would have had no current that would have been delivered to here. So currently we would have V is equal to Q over top of C, right? That's just a rewriting of the C is equal to Q over top of V. We would have to go and have, right now if we got zero volts, this value of coulombs would have to be at a value of zero as well. Because this C is just a constant, it's based upon the build, right? 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 times K times A all over top of D. 
So both of these with the switch open sit at a value of zero. Therefore, they've got values of zero volts because the circuit's not turned on. The instant that we go and close this switch in, we are going to go and establish a complete path for current flow. Has any coulombs of charge built up on this plate? Absolutely not. We don't have anything that has built up on this plate yet. But we do have at this point, we're going to go and have maximum amount of volts that's going to have to be dropped across some component. Now, if we have no coulombs of charge, the instant we close it, nothing has been stored on these plates yet. Therefore, this is still going to be at zero. Therefore, this V will still have to be at zero. That would mean that we would somehow have to drop our entire source voltage over top of this resistance. So we would have to have maximum current right now. So I'm just going to draw a little up arrow to go and show that we've got maximum current for the time being. That maximum current is going to go and flow through the circuit. And this is what's going to happen is we're going to go and have electrons that are going to travel along here. Those electrons are going to start to build up on here. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we're going to go and drive away electrons from the top and those electrons travel through like that. Our source, if I were to just draw a line, my source can't see what's downstream of here. It just sees it's sending current out, it's getting current back in. It doesn't care what it is that it's passing through. We're just passing current to this plate and driving current away from that plate. Now here's what happens. As we start to build these electrons onto here, that means that this Q value is going to start to raise, which would mean that this V value would have to start to raise. And according to Kirchhoff's law of voltage, I would have to have less volts that would be dropped across here. This voltage would have to be going down. The only way for that voltage to be going down would be if my current were going to be going down as well, the current that was going through that resistor. Right? Because resistance is a constant, K times L over top of CMA. And so what I'm going to have is just electrons that are flooding to here. The initial rush, we're going to have a huge rush of electrons. But then those electrons, it's like blowing up a balloon. You know, you get a lot of movement at first, but it gets harder and harder and harder to stuff more electrons on the plate, drive more and more away. And so our current is going to go and trickle down until eventually we're just going to just push that very last electron onto this plate. And when we push that last electron on, it'll expel the last one. And after that, there's no more current flow that's going to go and happen inside of our circuit. We would have a circuit where we have got Kirchhoff's law of voltage still satisfied. Check this out. There's no current that is going to be flowing inside of here. But I would have my full source voltage dropped or seen across here because I've got a full charge. I've got all of the coulombs, all of the electrons are stored on here and driven away from the other side. This one, if we've got full voltage over here, then we must have zero volts over here. And we've got zero volts over there because we're not pushing any more electrons through here. So I've got this switch that is still closed. I've got my source voltage, I've got my load voltage, and they're equivalent. We are satisfying all of our laws. This can be shown graphically through something that is going to go and look like this. Now, the two waveforms that we are going to go and see over here are going to be the voltage over top of my capacitor, which starts from zero volts, and it's going to go and rise. This is going to be the capacitor. And we are going to go and see the voltage that is going to be seen across the resistor, which is going to start out at zero, but the instant that the switch closes, it's going to spike up, and then it's going to go and drop back down. The voltage across the resistor is dropping as the voltage across the capacitor is seen to be rising off of these. You should recognize this curve. This is a, one of those universal exponential graphs that we took a look at when we were inside of inductors. Uh, inside of an inductor, we looked at our voltage and our current as well, and we saw that you know the amount of volts that we would be dropping across the inductor was going down, whereas for the capacitor, the amount of volts that we're dropping is going up during a DC charge that we have. Um, overall, this little graph over here is going to be very you know useful for defining what's happening inside of this circuit. This formula is actually probably your most useful one. The book doesn't go through the BQC. I find the BQC to be much easier to use than the Ohm's Law one that they have. But if you find that the Ohm's Law one works as well, that's completely fine. But if you're trying to find where this whole, you know, BQC thing is coming into in from the book, they don't actually show it inside there. I'm just showing it on here because I find it much easier to look at a physical quantity of components over here and how we're stuffing them all the way onto this thing. I do want to go and point out as well what would happen now if I were to go and open this switch. 
When I open this switch, what happens off of this? Well, I still have voltage that is going to be held across this capacitor because there's no complete path for this capacitor to go and discharge, right? We don't see anything that it can go and drive through. Yeah, we've got a resistor in front, but it would need to go and have a complete circuit. If I could go and find some way to go and jump from one side of the capacitor to the other, that cap would be able to go and discharge. How quickly it's going to go and discharge is all going to be dependent upon the resistance that I'm going to go and have inside of that path that we would go and provide for it. In some cases, if we charge up a capacitor and we just isolate it from the system at that point, we're going to go and see this thing now as being a temporary stored place for voltage, where it basically it's a temporary voltage supply that we're able to go and trigger off of there. They will leak. We talked about leaky capacitors. They will leak over time. So most caps, if you do charge them up, they're not going to go and hold onto their voltage for a very, very long time. Um, but it's going to be long enough for most of the circuit activations that we need. You know, usually where we're just looking for a little pulse and we'll see it, particularly in electronics where we use this whole charging up and discharging type of thing. The way that this charges is going to be done through those universal time constants that are going to be governed once again by a tau. And tau is going to be equal to my R times my C, my value of resistance multiplied by my value of my capacitance. If you go and compare that with your inductor, your inductor's also got a tau, but that one was going to be L over top of R. This one is just going to be R times C. It acts the same way as my inductive tau in that I need to go and have five time constants. One, two, three, four, five time constants before I am going to be at what we would refer to as a fully uh, charged state. It's also going to go and use the same initial rate of change, the 63.2% that we are going to go and have. There would be, if we did not have resistance inside of that circuit, we would go and have this instantaneous charge. And that's what this line is showing, just like how quickly that thing would be charging over time. But because we've got that resistance of our conductors and any other series uh, resistors we place with it, we will always go and carry this thing as a curve. We're jumping up to 0.632 on our first one over there. And after that, we go up to 0.632 of the difference on every single one of these as we go along. Use the exact same time tau constants as what you did on your you know, previous ones with the inductors, and you're gonna to get to the same type of things. Now, if we take a look at it, this tau also allows us, because tau is measured in seconds, it allows us to go and figure out time actual time that it would take for us to go and trigger something. If we said that this component, whatever this component is, triggers right at this voltage level, I would be able to correspond that using RC and I would be able to correspond that thing so that I could have one, two, three, four. I would be able to figure out exactly the size of resistance that I would need in order to get this thing up to that value of voltage so I could go and trigger that component. We'll see that inside of our particularly third year electronics where we're gonna be using these things as voltage dependent types of triggers. When we do have this capacitor charged all the way up, and provided that it were a perfect capacitor, I know we live in an imperfect world and you know, we're not gonna find the perfect capacitor out there, but if we did have a perfect capacitor, once we charge it up, it would stay charged indefinitely. And if it did stay charged indefinitely, it would go and have a way that we could measure that. That way that we measure the amount of charge off of there is gonna be off of this formula over here. And it's a very similar formula to what we've seen before. W is equal to 0 0.5 times C times V squared. This is gonna be my energy stored in joules, that's this. Multa is equal to 0 0.5 times my value in capacitance times my value in voltage, the maximum voltage across that capacitor that we are going to go and place. It is very similar to the stored energy one that we had for our inductor. The inductor one, you should remember, is 0 0.5 times my L times my I squared. Do note that what we are using inside of here is going to be what it reacts to, right? An inductor opposes changes in current. A capacitor is going to go and oppose any change in voltage. We're going to see that where this capacitor is going to try to maintain voltage inside of our circuit. It doesn't like that that voltage is changing across itself, so it you know, opposes that through the electrostatic fields, through the building up of charge. It makes it harder for that voltage to get up there, but the voltage obviously eventually does rise to that value, but it slows down that rate of voltage rise. If you were to compare that 
to what I would have in a circuit like this without a capacitor. I'll just go and put this thing in without a cap. So let's say this is my circuit over here. At the instant that I would go and close my switch over here, what I would see is that I would see I would have full voltage that would be placed across my circuit component. Right? We'd see that across the resistor. The resistor would go from zero all the way up to full value of voltage that it would want to stay at. If I want to slow down the rate of rise, I get to use that capacitor now uh, that I'm going to be able to go and slow that rate of rise. If I want to measure something and have a slow rate of rise, I can measure it across that capacitor that we'll see. Once we store energy onto that capacitor, so putting our cap back into here, that energy gets held. Just drop you holes onto here and some electrons. That energy gets held until we provide a way for that thing to go and discharge. And we do need to provide some sort of a discharge. By Canadian Electrical Code, we are required by law to make sure that all of our caps are going to go and discharge because if we got live caps, uh, what happens is that, you know, people operate a system, they shut off the breaker and they say, hey, the system is dead now, I can go in and work on it. And then they walk into, you know, a 600 volt cap or something like that. We don't want these things to happen. These are obviously dangers. And the whole point of the Canadian Electrical Code is to go and prevent danger and safety incidents. So we are going to be required to go and discharge that capacitor. Before we take a look at how the discharge happens, let's go and talk about how quickly it needs to happen. And for that, we need to pull up our Canadian Electrical Code. Here's section 26 of our Canadian Electrical Code. It's kind of our general installation section. If we take a look at rule 26.222, it talks about drainage of stored charge. And it says that all caps, first rule, sub rule there, all caps shall be provided with a means of draining the stored charge. And the draining means shall be such, sub rule two, that the residual voltage will be reduced to 50 volts or less after the capacitor is disconnected from the source of supply. It has to be within one minute for anything that is 750 volts or less, and it has to be within five minutes in the case of anything that's more than 750. What we talked about in the previous learning task, so you don't want to discharge a cap fast. Obviously, if it's at a very high value of voltage, it's going to have a large amount of coulomb stored on it. Therefore, you don't want to go and dump them off. So they give us a five minutes for anything that's going to be a high voltage cap. But for your low voltage caps, it needs to be under a minute that we're going to take this thing down to 50 volts. The discharge circuit has to be permanently connected to the terms of the capacitor bank or provided with a means of automatically connecting it upon removal of voltage from the line. Uh, usually we don't want to go and have to do sub rule B. That would involve us having a transfer switch that when we kill power to the cap, that this other switch would have to activate to put a resistor path across there. Usually we want to have something that's going to be permanently connected. The discharge circuit shall not be switched or connected by manual means. You cannot rely on somebody to go up there and press a discharge button or anything like that. It has to be automatic. And then it does talk about in sub rule five that there's some components, motors, transformers, etc., that do have continuous paths inside of them that a cap can discharge through. Those are considered to be fine for their discharge path. So now going back into what we have over here. We've established the fact that we need to go and dump this thing down in under one minute. Okay, we're working underneath 750 volts. That's what we're covering. We're not doing high voltage. Uh, we've got to go and dump this thing down to under 50 volts in under one minute. And so what I have here is I'm going to have a switch that is going to go and give me a charge path. And it's going to go into give me a discharge path that I'm going to have. Let's go and close our switch to the charge path. Instant that we close our switch into the charge path, we know that our voltage across here is equal to my Q over top of my C. We know that my voltage over top of here is equal to my I times my R that I'm going to go and have for that. So if I close in that switch, that would mean that I would have to have electrons that would be moving through here and starting to build up on here. The instant that we close that switch, we're gonna have a maximum rush. We got all this free real estate here, whoosh. We're gonna get this huge inrush of electrons that are gonna surge over towards the plates. And as they do so, they're gonna go and boot a whole pile from the opposite plate that are then going to go and travel up and through that resistor. So at the instant that we turned on, this volts over here is gonna go high because we'll have maximum amount of current. So it's gonna go boom, up high, and then it's gonna to start to drop back down. The reason it's dropping down is because we're building up electrons on here, which means that my Q is building up, which means that my voltage is building up. 
coulomb is the physical number of electrons it's building up so my volts are building up on here which means that this volts would have to be dropping and the only way for it to drop would be for my current to drop so i see that during my charge cycle this one starts high and then drops down this one over here my cap starts low and charges up it's going to take this thing five time constants defined by you know rc once I get this thing fully charged up, what I would then need to do is my switch, which would have to be automatic, is then going to open for whatever reason, you know, we've got the system charged and it transfers over to this path over here. When it transfers over to this path, now my capacitor is gonna go and become the source of voltage, right? If I take a look at it, here's my capacitor. This side is charged up positive, this side is charged up negative over here. And so what's gonna happen is these electrons see a way to get back over here. Remember, we've got charge separators. The charge separator was us applying this voltage, which then went and distorted the orbitals. Now those orbitals are holding those electrons on these plates as is. But as soon as we provide a path, those electrons want to go and balance. Nature tends to want to balance. So these electrons are gonna go up and through this path, and they're gonna come back, they're gonna fill the holes that are on this side over here. They've recombined, and we are going to go and draw. So what we'll see on this thing during the discharge is that I'm going to go and have a discharge voltage that's just gonna go down like that. Oops, sorry, I drew my curve upside down. The discharge voltage is gonna go down like that. It starts out high, it drops rapidly as we initially have a lot of voltage across here, right? Because we have a lot of coulombs of charge. Just raise those areas, we don't need those ones right now. Initially, we've got a lot of volts across there, therefore we're going to go and have a large rush of currents that's going to go through here. But then my voltage decreases because my coulombs, the stored number of electrons, is going down. And if that's going down, then I'm going to have less current. Remember, I is equal to E over top of R. And my volts over here which is the source, are dropping. Therefore, this volts will be dropping. Therefore, this current that's going through here is going to be dropping as well. My cap will go and discharge through this. The beautiful thing is I can go and have a different value of resistance in my discharge path compared to my charge path. If I want my discharge path to go and happen really, really rapidly, I can go and do that by sticking in a small resistance, right? Tau is equal to RC. So if I go with a small resistance, I'm going to have a short tau, which means it's going to discharge really quickly. And if I want to have a long charge, I can do that through this, make this one a large resistor, and it's going to have a long charge. So I can start to go and do these things where I'm going to be able to synthesize waveforms. If I go with a long charge, I'm going to be able to have a waveform that ramps up like that, and then I can have a short resistance, and it's going to go oof, like that. And then it's going to go and turn on, and we're going to be able to start creating some fancy types of waveforms, triggering types of waveforms, sawtooths, as we call these ones that we'll use inside of some electronic circuits. These DC capacitors are always going to oppose any sort of a change in voltage. The way that they're opposing their change in voltage is they're just dumping electrons either into the circuit or they're accepting electrons onto that circuit. When I look at this, and I'm, let me just erase just a whole pile of these here in a second. When I take a look at connecting in this circuit over here, at that instant, my volts over here were at zero. Now I'm gonna apply my full value of voltage. It says 12 volt supply over there. As soon as I apply that 12 volt to this thing, this thing is going to go and oppose it. It's going to slow down that rate of rise of voltage. It will let the voltage eventually rise to that full 12 volts over top of itself, but it's going to go and oppose that. Same as when I go and take that now fully charged up capacitor. So I charge this one here, we'll draw a little pile onto this thing. It's charged up to 12 volts now. And then when I go and switch the circuit over here, now it's going to go and oppose that change. Right now it's got no volts across here. This thing's got, you know, zero volts across it. Uh, this thing is going to have current that's going to go and flow, but it's not going to allow the current to instantly drop. It's not going to go from 12 volts down to zero instantly. It's going to go and slow its way down to that 12 volts. 
So capacitance is a property of an electric circuit that's going to oppose any change in voltage. And the way that it's opposing a change in voltage is it's controlling the current, how quickly it's accepting and releasing electrons from the plate itself. Okay, that's it for our DC one. Let's now go and take a look at some formulas and what to do when we start series paralleling these things.